Hi everyone, I think we'll, we'll kick off now. The talk's also being recorded, so for those who are, who are slightly late in joining, they can, they can see it on another platform. Um, my name is Juliet, and I'm the Programme and Communications Coordinator for INFAO. So um, I'm going to give a brief introduction today before handing over to our speaker, Alex, for the presentation. Um, and there'll be a chance to ask questions after the talk. I think looking at numbers, it'll be really nice if we can unmute you at the end so you can ask your own questions, but please also enter them into the chat. It's also quite useful so you don't sort of forget the questions throughout. So um, that's what's going to happen at the end of the talk. Um, I'll give a brief introduction now to INTBAL. So for those of you who aren't familiar with INTBAL and what we do, we are a global network dedicated to creating better places to live through traditional building architecture and urbanism. And we do this through workshops, summer schools, conferences, awards, and competitions throughout the year. Our three objectives are research, education, and engagement, which we try to do as widely as possible on the value of traditional architecture and urban design. And our active ne network consists of individuals and independently run chapters in over 30 countries. And so we're very lucky today to have our speaker, Alex Barra, join us in this materials focused session for our Intbau Summer Series Session 2 on, on the online platform of Zoom. Alex is founder and managing director at UK Hempcrete, and this company provides specialist contractor services in construction. It's also really well known for its innovation in zero carbon buildings and the construction of structural and thermal envelopes from renewable or recyclable materials. And Alex has co-authored The Hempcrete Book, which was published in 2014, and this is a fascinating guide to this remarkable building material. And so without much further ado, I'll pass the, uh, the virtual mic over to Alex, who's going to be sharing with us some slides. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for the introduction, Juliet. And um, uh, as you were saying, uh, my company, UK Hempcrete, uh, specializes in the structural and thermal envelope of buildings um, from bio-based carbon sequestering and often recycled materials. So we act as a specialist contractor for construction um, services on site. Uh, we also supply um, the materials that we work with to other contractors and to self builders. Um, and we offer um, a sort of uh, consultancy design uh, and training service um, nationally and uh, and some, somewhat internationally as well. <laughs> um, and as Juliet was saying, uh, in 2014, we published a book called The Hempcrete Book, which is a kind of um, guide to um, how to build with hempcrete. So from the design of hempcrete buildings and the deta construction detailing right through to a sort of practical um, how to uh, construct on site. So um, we're going to take um, a bit of time uh, this afternoon to look at um, a range of uses of hempcrete in uh, different contexts. So um, hempcrete is used um, widely and in quite a flexible way uh, in different new build contexts and also in um, retrofit of traditional uh, buildings, often historic buildings, but um, basically in, in the UK buildings that were built before the First World War, so those buildings that were built with lime and other um, uh, vapour open construction materials. So I'm just going to start off by <clears throat> um, showing you a little bit of um, uh, the range of things that we do as a company. Um, so we do a lot of, um, I suppose most of our construction work is in the um, bespoke one-off um, house builds in the domestic sector and I think that's because broadly hempcrete is still at the sort of early adopter stage it's it's been um, in terms of natural uh, construction materials it's been quite successful in crossing over into the mainstream um, industry it's been used by a wide range of contractors large and small but at the moment um, most of the, the projects that are done with hempcrete in the UK are within the domestic sector. We also do some, um, uh, as I said, retrofit of listed buildings and other traditional, um, traditionally built, uh, traditionally constructed um, buildings. And we do some commercial subcontract, such as the buildings on the uh, right, um, which uh, tend to be um, that we take responsibility for the, the design and build of the hempcrete elements within a larger um, contractor's um, 
project. Um, just looking back over the last 21 years that we've been building with hempcrete in the UK, these are a few, none of these are my projects, but these are a few sort of um, projects that are notable. We've got a few um, hempcrete housing estates dotted around the country. Um, the one on the left is in Letchworth, um, tomorrow's Garden City. And then on the right, uh, upper photo is clay fields um, in Suffolk. And um, the uh, lower one is a, a development in Dis in Norfolk. So most of those um, housing developments were partly funded by the Renewable House Programme back in 2010. The last Labour government um, provided some funding to explore the use of sustainable construction materials and that was interpreted differently in, in a range of market and social housing by a range of different developers up and down the country. Um, and I think seven out of the 12 projects were hempcrete. So there's two more of them there. So the top left is the triangle in Swindon, which is the development of hempcrete homes, mixture of flats and houses. And the bottom right is Callow Lands in Watford, which I think is social housing. Um, so there, we've, around the UK, we've got some reasonably large scale housing developments using hempcrete. And then um, also the, you know, I'm not sure of the exact number, but um, probably in the hundreds of commercial buildings, um, notable examples being um, on the bottom left, the Adnams Brewery in Suffolk, which was quite an early hempcrete building. Um, and that's, uh, hempcrete's really popular with um, uh, brewers, wine merchants, because it's, um, as we'll go on to talk about in a second, it keeps um, a really steady internal temperature without any requirement for heating or cooling, or at least a much reduced requirement for heating and cooling. So if you're in that industry, then um, having a building that has a hempcrete fabric is really uh, advantageous in terms of your costs. Uh, and the top right is a flagship Marks and Spencer's uh, store in Cheshire Oaks, the Wirral, um, and that's a hempcrete precast panel system that was built in 2013, I think. So, um, time to introduce the materials, what we're talking about when we're talking about hempcrete, or you may hear it um, referred to as hemp lime, um, is it's a biocomposite material made by mixing the, the woody, woody stem of the industrial hemp plant um, with a lime, building lime or lime-based binder to create a kind of matrix material, um, which is made up of thousands, millions of tiny particles of plant aggregate tied together with this building lime web running throughout the material. So, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, you might be able to, but um, so industrial hemp, for those who aren't familiar with it, is the cannabis sativa plant. And it's, uh, we're basically talking about a strain that's been bred to have very low levels of THC, which is the active psychotropic uh, compound in the plant. And that's um, uh, intentionally bred like that to uh, allow it um, uh, to be grown under um in, in Western countries under the sort of prevailing um, prohibition of uh, controlled drugs, uh, sort of, um, uh, yeah. So basically you need to get a license to grow it. Um, it's grown and has been grown now since 1992, again, all over the UK. Hemp uh, in its natural form was always grown uh, or has been grown in the UK for centuries and was a really important part of um, our, uh, our sort of development as a nation, um, mainly because these um, fibres, if you look at the bottom left, the thin fibres, the bast fibres from the, around the outside of the stem uh, make really good, um, strong textiles. Uh, and ropes, so they were really important for um, the uh, the navy in this country because we're an island. Um, and at one time, hemp was grown everywhere. Um, 
currently we're growing a lot of fiber varieties again in the UK. So in the top right, you can see the bast fiber, which is extracted from the outer uh, stem being um, baled up, ready to go off for a variety of industrial applications. And what's left is this woody cellulose um, core of the plant stem, which gets chopped up, broken up, and that's um, the, the dry hemp aggregate that we use in hempcrete. Um, it's worth saying at this point that hemp grows, uh, or the varieties that we're using in the UK grow three to four meters in four months in, in an English summer. Um, and uh, it's very, as you can just about see in that top left photo, it's a very tall, um, na uh, thin plant with all its leaves and branches at the top. And that uh, in order to support itself, uh, what the plant's doing is relative to other plants is exceedingly quickly growing this hard woody stem to support itself, which is uh, made from cellulose. And it does that by, lay by absorbing relative to other plants, a huge amount of atmospheric CO2, which then gets laid down in the cellulose of that stem. So that means that the carbon sequestration is all within that woody stem and then that's the bit of the plant that we chop up and mix with lime and lock up in a building instead of leaving it to rot down and release the carbon back into the atmosphere. So remarkably, because the lime that we use as a binder is a uh, you know, relatively high embodied energy material because it's produced by burning rock in a kiln at a thousand degrees centigrade. But even after the production of the lime and the transport of both materials and the energy in farming and the energy in construction, um, remarkably that hempcrete as a material is a, still a net sequesterer of carbon. So as a material, it's better than zero carbon. It's locking up more atmospheric CO2 uh, in the wall than was used to produce it. Um, the other really important thing um, that the stem is doing is uh, of the plant is when it's a lot, when it's living, the cell cellular structure of that stem is all about taking water from the ground and getting it to the top of the plant as quickly as possible. So that gives the hemp stalk some really useful properties within the fabric of a building because um, combined with the lime in the binder and the typical finish for a hempcrete wall, which is lime plaster, um, it means the whole uh, wall is vapor open, but it also means that the the, the structure, the cell structure of the hemp stalk itself is geared towards absorbing moisture. So when humidity is high in next to the wall, so it's, for example, high internal relative humidity, some of that humidity is absorbed into the wall and condenses in the pores structure of the hemp plant and then is released out again when humidity drops. And that's a really important um, characteristic for the health and well-being of um, the occupants of the building. So we're taking that dry aggregate, as I said, we're mixing it with a lime or lime-based binder. Um, there are oh, must be sort of half a dozen uh, on the market in the UK at the moment. They're either um, a very strong, high, naturally uh, occurring hydraulic lime, uh, or they're a formulated lime um, either using pozzolans or a bit a little bit of cement to get the set because it's not like building with a um, stones where you're you're essentially stacking up a large aggregate and using uh, mortar to sort of um, cushion between the different uh, stones and it the whole thing has its own center of gravity and will stack and stay up you're talking about tiny particles of hemp which have to be um, formed in shuttering and then they have the, the whole thing has to set quickly enough to um, hold its not only its own shape but the weight of all the material that you're going to put above it. So that's the resulting material. So those two things are wet mixed in a it's different ways of applying it which we'll look at in a second but the most in its most simple form wet mixed in a large pan mixer and you can see hopefully looking at that photograph that 
hempcrete when it comes out of the mixer is not a pouring um, consistency. It's more like a sort of damp solid um, and is uh, forming a kind of um, natural matrix of all the pieces of hemp, which traps a lot of air inside the material when it sets. And hempcrete is used in, uh, as I said, a variety of contexts and a variety of um, uh, different elements within the building. So most commonly used for walls, um, but can be used as part of a vapor permeable floor slab and also in um, uh, as part of um, uh, a vapor open roof insulation build up. So the three different applications in the building have um, slightly different formulations. So in walls, the hemp kit has to be strong enough to hold itself up. So um, uh, it, it needs enough binder that it's going to hold itself and support the material above it. Um, I should say hempcrete is, is very strong and hard once it's set. It's quite strong in tension, but it's because of the air that's trapped in the material, it's not sufficiently strong, um, strong enough in compression to be load bearing. So in, in new build, there is always some kind of structural element within the building. And in domestic contexts, that would tend to be um, a timber frame. Uh, hempcrete as used as a load bearing floor slab that people are going to be walking on will be mixed a little bit stronger to make it resilient enough uh, for people to walk on it and in the roof where it hasn't really got to hold itself up it's just got to set and hold its position uh, within the roof structure and you want it to be as insulating as possible um, it's mixed at a slightly lower ratio of um, binder so the really interesting thing, which we'll come back to in a, a further slide, is that hemp, because of the lime binder, hempcrete is not only an insulation, it also has thermal mass. So as well as insulating with the air that's trapped in the material, it's also storing heat in the, in the, uh, the mass of the material itself. So hempcrete in walls um, is mixed at a density of around 300 kilograms per cubic meter. Um, in roofs, that goes down to about uh, 200 kilograms per cubic meter. And in floors, as I said, we, we increase the ratio of binder and that gets us to around 500 kilograms per cubic meter in floors. So you can see that it is, as well as an insulation, it has a moderate level of um, thermal mass storage capacity. So there's different ways of applying hempcrete on site. Um, the two at the top are the most common probably at the moment in this country um, and they are both um, uh, ways of applying hempcrete uh, uh, cast in situ in a building on site. So that, that, that would either be mixing in a big mixer such as the one we've just seen and placing into temporary formwork around the structural frame. Uh, or spray applying the hempcrete, so mixing it, sort of continuous mixing uh, using an adapted render pump. Um, and both of those have the advantage that you're um, casting the, the entire thermal envelope of the building in one piece, which is, has some really good advantages for thermal performance. You can miss, uh, you can make sure there's no thermal bridging through the envelope uh, and you're making one piece of material to make airtight uh, when you come to render it. Um, the one drawback of casting on site is the drying time on site which is can be quite extended and takes longer depending on um, the prevailing weather climate um, at the time that time of year that you're casting. So um, to get around uh, the fact that that drying period is a bit too unpredictable for large-scale commercial um, scale builds. There's also a couple of different ways of using the material in a precast form, either as a precast, um, simple precast block of hempcrete that gets laid in a lime mortar, uh, as you can see bottom right or bottom left. Um, that's the Marks and Spencer's building that we saw earlier under construction with a um, precast um, structural, uh, or, well actually in this case cladding panel, because it's got a big uh, steel frame. Um, obviously, both of those methods, as assemble on site um, methods, are a bit more inherently a bit more vulnerable to thermal bridging and air tightness. So 
the design is a bit more critical and uh, li becomes a little bit more complicated with those systems. So just an overview of the detailing, we've, we've talked about this already. Um, most commonly hempcrete's used in the walls of a building. Um, you can also use it, as I said, as part of a, um, an ins insulating vapor open floor slab. In that case, as shown in that schematic, it's, um, it's definitely better to keep the hempcrete as a material above external ground level. And that's because um, it's a natural plant-based um, aggregate. So even though the lime does protect it from rotting, if it's in a situation where it's constantly exposed to standing water or, or water running through it, then it will eventually soften. So like any other kind of natural uh, construction, straw, cob, whatever, um, hempcrete walls or hempcrete building is always built up on a, um, a masonry stem wall um, first just to keep the, the actual hempcrete and the lime um, finishes away from the floor externally. Uh, and as I said, it's, because it's possible to use hempcrete in roof insulation, um, you can have uh, essentially the, the whole thermal envelope cast as one piece of material, um, which has many advantages for thermal performance. Um, perhaps more typically, um, hempcrete gets combined with other materials within the building. Um, so this um, uh, icon is sort of representing that you might have within the roof um, a different kind of natural um, bio-based in insulation between the rafters, such as a recycled wood fiber, sheep's wool. Um, there's a hemp, hemp wool insulation that's made with the bast fibers from the outside of the plant. Uh, and then if you can see the orange line over the top, that's indicating um, a sort of tongue and groove wood fiber um, insulating sarking board over the top of the rafters, which is how you ensure a uh, really good airtight um, seal over the roof whilst maintaining a fully vapor open roof structure. Um, and then the spot the difference on the last one, uh, instead of a hempcrete floor slab, we've got um, a uh, lime sand screed with underfloor heating in uh, and probably a recycled foam glass um, insulating uh, sub base layer. And that's probably, again, is, is more commonly done than a hempcrete floor. Um, but really just making the point that we hempcrete is one of a palette of natural vapor open materials that we can detail together in a building um, and complement each other perfectly. And here's some uh, mid, you know, part, part way through the construction shots of some of the things we've been talking about. So, um, on the left, you can see there that that's the, um, it's not a great photo, but it, that's the eaves of a hempcrete building in the corner, just as the hempcrete wall, the hempcrete wall always comes up to the top of the rafter level. Um, and you can see that the wall's gonna run up the gable there, but between the rafters just there, you've got um, uh, a space, because in this case, there's gonna be sheep's wool between the rafters, but you can see that this tongue and groove um, wood fiber sarking board is gets fixed down and pushes down really tight onto the top of the hempcrete wall so you get a really good solid airtight junction at the eaves. Um, bottom right uh, you can see wood fiber board again there being used internally as a uh, insulating ceiling carrier board for lime plaster and uh, the typically the finish for hempcrete is a lime or clay plaster internally straight onto the material and then externally uh, a lime render. Although we can, we'll go on to look at some different external finishes in a second. Um, a few more construction photos. So yeah, bottom left, that's the hemp um, fiber bat insulation. Um, bottom center is the recycled foam glass um, drainage layer going in under a floor slab. Uh, and that uh, top left, that's the lime sand screed being laid on top. Um, we've covered a lot of this, but this is just my, my reminder in case I've missed anything that I haven't told you. So um, this is really me thinking about where our clients come from, how they find hempcrete. 
um, and some of them are, um, it, it, there is an overlap between the groups, but some of them are, are really concerned with the low impact, um, super s sustainable um, credentials of the material. Um, more and more now people are really waking up to the impacts on our own health and well-being that we're seeing from the the type of materials that we're using and have been using for the last what 60 70 years in our buildings in the uk which uh, tend to be petrochemical or plastic based materials um often quite toxic uh, often with um sort of issues with off gassing of um, volatile organic compounds um which have uh, led to quite poor indoor air quality and and a rise in conditions diverse as allergies to cancer um and as we uh, as we all try to sort of future proof our homes and build homes that are more efficient and make them ever more airtight that uh, coincidentally makes the problem of poor indoor air quality uh, even worse because we're trapping ourselves in a more and more airtight space with some quite toxic substances. So one of the benefits of hempcrete is that the lime in the binder um, provides three functions. So it, it stops um, hempcrete catching fire. It's like trying to set fire to a, a breeze block. Um, it stops the hempcrete rotting up to a point as long as it's not sitting in water. Um, lime is a powerful antifungal uh, agent and it's also something that, that pests don't eat, be they rodents or insects or uh, whatever. So hempcrete as a material doesn't need any further chemical treatment to um, for any of those reasons and that's what brings a lot of people to the material because it's um, a way of building reduces the amount of chemicals that they're putting into the home. Um, it's Then the third group is generally people who've bought um, a historically important building and come up against uh, the fact that they can't uh, retrofit it to improve the thermal performance using conventional insulation materials um, and that um, hopefully the conservation officer will stop them from putting Kingspan or um, any kind of non-vapour open insulation into the building. Um, and hempcrete's especially suited, we'll go on to look at a little bit of um, a couple of slides about the um, building conservation and retrofit, but um, it's particularly suited to um, old the fabric of old buildings, both in the way that it's applied and in the way that it works in harmony with the building. Um, just quickly, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, this is uh, from a specific type of hempcrete block, um, but you can take this as roughly the performance for all hempcrete with a little, um, you know, little movement in different directions depending on the different binders. So you can see um, the thickness uh, in centimetres along the top because this is a range of blocks. Um, and the density is obviously consistent at 300 and in this case 330 kilograms per meter cubed the thermal conductivity compared to other um, materials is uh, you know not great in terms of insulation and that's because hempcrete has um, this uh, mass brought about by the lime so it's as we said it's a moderate uh, density material so the key thing is it has this specific heat capacity which uh, much more so than any other uh, natural or synthetic insulation, arguably apart from maybe um, aerated concrete um, blocks. It has this ability to insulate and store heat in the same material. So um, you can see um, if, as you look towards the the uh, thicker ends, so we, we would typically be building or casting uh, walls that are between um, 30 to 40 centimeters uh, in wide in the UK to meet um, our requirements for insulation uh, in terms of the U value of the material. Um, but what happens is in practice, hempcrete, hempcrete's performance on site far exceeds what you would be expecting from the U value alone because the U value is only talking about the insulation, not the thermal mass. So we're in a position really where we have to over specify hempcrete currently to meet the 
requirement for U value, um, but we're getting uh, you know much higher levels of thermal performance. Um, typically, when we build a building um, with no heating fitted in the building, but the doors and windows in, um, usually before we've actually plastered or rendered the outside of it to make the material airtight, um, with doors and windows fitted, no heating, um, the, build, the house building will be keeping a steady 16 to 18 degrees centigrade inside. Um, and uh, it has that effect of having, um, keeping the building warm in the winter and cooler in the summer than it, than uh, conventional materials would. Um, other key things to, to pick out, um, non-flammable. So this is um, some photos from a hempcrete house in um, South Devon that caught fire a couple of years ago. Um, this is what you what you typically get if you expose hempcrete to uh, intense heat and flame. You get a little bit of eventually get a bit of charring of the material but it doesn't ignite. There's no spread of flame and there's no sort of toxic chemicals within the material to sort of off gas in response to the heat. This damage here was caused not by the fire but by the fire brigade who were trying to get into the wall to stop the Douglas fir frame um, smouldering. Um, just briefly, the the um, if I go back two slides, um, you'll see that um, this is quite key. So if you look along the the time at the bottom, um, that's the phase shift time, which is the time taken for um, energy as heat to pass through the fabric of the building, and we don't have a two hundred mil or a twenty centimeter block in this table but you can see that if we did it would have a phase shift time of around 12 hours and that's quite important because that's the the time between uh, diurnal temperature changes so this is a graph from an experimental building at um, University of Bath in 2006 which had uh, 200 millimeters of hempcrete around a timber frame and uh, unheated and monitored um, throughout the course of uh, several weeks, months. Um, what you can see is the purple line is the day-night temperature changes outside the building and the red line is the relatively consistent uh, or uh, much less fluctuation in the internal temperature inside the building um, with no uh, heating at all and that's the that's the kind of passive thermal performance that that hempcrete provides at 200 mil. I'm not allowed to build a new build uh, hempcrete house with 200 mil wall because it doesn't meet the insulation requirements. So we have to sort of over specify it in new build. Um, this is just um, a series of slides just showing you how hempcrete was, it was first um, invented in France in the late eighties and has been used quite extensively throughout Europe, notably in uh, the UK, Belgium, Italy, uh, Switzerland, and is now spreading to lots of other um, European countries are starting to pick it up, but also spreading around the world. So this is um, a development of 13 homes in Western Australia that, um, consulted on, which is one of the, f probably at the time was the largest hempcrete development in Australia. Um, this is a hempcrete roundhouse um, a domestic um, uh, home in California that we consulted on with the builders, uh, self builders that built that house. Um, this is a company in uh, Hempcrete startup in Lithuania um, who uh, came over and, and met us here. And then I went out and did some consultancy with them. And this was their first uh, house dome that they were building. Um, hempcrete's also been used quite extensively in um, uh, kind of, um, I suppose, sort of disaster relief reconstruction efforts. Um, so this is um, a hospital in Nepal um, being built of hempcrete after the um, earthquake there a few years ago. And um, Diraj is uh, continuing to build lots of um, hempcrete buildings out in Nepal. Um, and these guys are mixing hempcrete in Haiti um, as part of the reconstruction efforts and re, um, building people's homes in Haiti. Uh, 
and this is a lady who I um, was able to do some work with when she was doing her masters in at Sheffield uh, University um, May from um, Vietnam who has kind of developed a, a hempcrete uh, or a hemp no it's not hemp it's rice husk <laughs> that's the point of what I'm saying so um, she's uh, in when we were working in the UK she was using hemp as an aggregate because she couldn't get a hold of waste waste rice husk in Yorkshire so uh, but when she went home she's developed this system which is um, a hemp a, a lime clay rice block and this is just to demonstrate that really as the technology um, of this biocomposite material moves around the world it can be adapted to suit um, both whatever the local geology uh, has for you in terms of binder materials um, and also in whatever your local source of um, waste bioaggregate is. And that has implications for both the um, viability of the material on the local, locally sourced, because clearly we don't want to be shipping materials around the world. Uh, so it's, it's about the local sourcing, but it's also about um, different binders being more appropriate in different climates. So for example, um, Vietnam has a lot of clay. Clay makes a denser, um, material than lime as a binder but um, that's quite appropriate in Vietnam which is a lot closer to the equator than the UK is so up in northern European latitudes we're really interested in getting as much insulation into the material as possible whereas in sort of peri-equatorial zones um, you're going to want to get as much thermal mass into the material as possible so that you uh, because that's uh, relatively much more important um, in, in um, hot zones so this is just showing you a few of the the domestic builds that we have done and really just to demonstrate the different um, uh, external finishes so a lot of timber cladding lime render um, usually combined with um, a natural roof covering just because of the um, designers and the, the client base that we're working with that's typically what they go for um, it's possible to use stone or brick cladding um, as a as an external finish um, typically built with lime mortar to um, enable the the wall build up to remain fully vapor permeable and this is a, a selection of internal finishes from our buildings um, again you can see um, uh, you know, the aesthetic is um, sort of quite similar to traditional construction. So, uh, you, you know, again, there's so many different lime plaster products on the market nowadays that you can have something that's quite textured and natural and subtle, or you can have something that's very um, minimalist and smooth and, um, you know, highly polished and uh, not necessarily um, identifiable as anything other than... Um, a, you know conventional modern building um so just going to have a look at a couple of um slides of a to take you through the process of a new build house it's a bit blurry that slide but this is um a, a house we've been building up in inverness or just outside inverness so typically we'd have a um, an untreated softwood frame because that's going to get wrapped in hempcrete so the lime in the hempcrete is going to um prevent that frame from rotting uh, you know because it's buried within the hempcrete wall in this case we've got a um, sort of glue lamb roof structure um, the brief was that she wanted us kind of to live in an upturned boat so we've sort of got that on the inside but not quite on the outside she's ended up with a mansard roof so in this case uh, we're using a combination of precast hempcrete blocks internally tied back to the frame and then we're going to cast hempcrete um, on the outside uh, to cover the frame so you get that continuous layer on the outside of the building which is going to sort out any thermal bridging and be easy to make airtight. Um, so you can see there with the blocks all installed so we're now going to put up scaffolding and then hempcrete the outside of it. This is going to have um, a hempcrete uh, roof as well so it's not the floor but the walls and the roof are all hempcrete continuous so the net the um, big mixer comes on site and we mix up the wet cast hempcrete to install um, 
around the walls and over the roof of the building. In this case, we dealt with the arch by using a reed board, um, which is obviously a kind of vapor open plaster carrier board that because it's um, uh, reeds and it's bound with wire in one direction will will curve to the shape of the building. So we left that in place as permanent formwork and placed the hempcrete outside of it. And that's the hempcrete installed, roof on over the top of the hempcrete, um, ready to be rendered. We haven't actually rendered it yet, but we have plastered it uh, just last week. And there's some shots from the inside with the lime plaster um, applied over that reed board matting. Uh, so it's looking fairly upturned boat like um, and then so this is what we spend the other sort of 50% of our time doing when we're not building new build uh, houses uh, and that is um, using hempcrete to to retrofit to repair and uh, retrofit um, uh, mainly historic buildings but a range of traditional buildings um, and the two main ways of using it are as an infill material to historic timber frames which then gets a lime render on the outside and lime plaster on the inside um, or as a sort of solid wall um, insulation applied to existing masonry walls obviously within that context uh, you know within those two two main uh, categories um, it, you're almost you know, there clearly there's some there's some key techniques that remain the same, but you're really designing a bespoke um, detail for every building that you come to because every building is um, different in some way. And it's really important that when you're detailing hempcrete in a historic building that you're working, the, the person who's doing the detailing understands uh, hempcrete and old buildings because when you're do, working getting right into the fabric of the building like that that's when you're at the biggest risk of um doing something that's really going to alter the character of the building um one of hempcrete's main advantages in this context is that it's a loose fill material that sets and holds its shape so it can once you any void that you can shutter it will go in and fill every bit of that cavity and then go rock hard and stay the shape that was that you put it in so if you imagine taking one of these old timber frames that's really warped and twisted and gnarled uh, and has bits missing you know uh, really strange shaped timbers um, and you try to imagine cutting a, a board insulation to fit in there um, and the time and the difficulty of getting that um, right compared to wet mixing a material and just shuttering and putting it in and it it goes in fills every bit goes right up to the timber and then sets um, the other option obviously is to put a bat insulation in uh, and then have some kind of plaster render carrier either side but the challenge there is making that timber frame panel airtight so that you're not losing um, heat from inside the building so um, as I said can be used as a um, uh, cast up against an existing masonry wall. So this was uh, repurposing an old um, granary building for native architects' uh, new office. So these panels were, in fact, they did it themselves. I went and did a training course and uh, they, they all um, mucked in and got this uh, these panels cast. Um, the uh, plastering was then done and we we kind of in this end panel which was going to be their meeting room we um, came up with the idea of replicating their logo in the lime plaster and we had a sort of um, stainless steel angle bead that we plastered up to to leave a sort of hempcrete truth window in relief so that everybody who came into there sat down in their meeting room got to see hempcrete <laughs> staring them in the face and uh, here just demonstrating you can use hempcrete it quite happily as a, an external solid wall insulation as well. So this is um, just against the gable of a, a Victorian terrace in Oxford. Uh, and again, this is kind of um, 100 mil of hempcrete cast against the brickwork at the end of the building. And then on the right hand side, you can see that finished lime, lime rendered and to be with a, a pre-pigmented lime render. So it doesn't look out of place with the uh, existing colours in the 
stonework painted stonework it looks like from here um this a uh, little just a little case study for you um this is um late 17th century house in Worcestershire that we were asked to come and um, just do one small elevation of the building because there, there was a lot of moisture issues. So this is the, the panels that we did to the left of the front door and this is how they were when we got to them. And you can see probably there's quite a bit of um, signs of, of, of the panels being quite wet in places. Um, and uh, this is, these had been retrofitted in the 1980s um, and they had ply externally with um, expanded metal lath and cement render over and Dulux weather shield, which was trapping the moisture in nicely. Uh, the in interior of the panel was um, lined out in softwood and then filled with rock wool or kingspan or, you know, polystyrene or bubble wrap or whatever they had lying around that they thought was going to be an insulating material so the first thing we had to do is strip all of that old material out um, get a look at the building and as you can see there if you can see my cursor towards the bottom right of that photo you've got some areas where the frame is really not um, mortised and tenon together anymore because those uh, um, joints and the frame timbers themselves are rotting out and if you look to the left of the um, gorilla tub in the in the corner uh, you can just see the the corner post of the building which actually is the building so twisted that the the corner and the, the sole plate in the corner is actually out further than the overhang of the building so again that's been taking a considerable wetting uh, and it's really rotted away um, so what we had to do was um, splice in some new oak timbers into the uh, structure to make it structurally sound and then hemp treated uh, within the panels um, we use a lattice uh, structure of um, round wood um, hazel coppiced hazel just because it's local it's quite strong in the round and it's a sort of it's a nod towards the the wattle that was originally there in the wattle and door panels without trying to sort of replicate it um, and the reason that there's hempcrete blocks in the top of the panels was because there was this uh, internal panelling in the bedroom upstairs, uh, not historically important panelling, but we didn't want to wet cast hempcrete up against their sort of internal panelling in the bedroom and not have it drying properly through the panelling. So once that's been in, uh, installed, the hempcrete gets scratched back a bit just to... Um, uh, you know to soften its shape in the building and then it gets lime plastered uh, lime rendered rather in this case um, with a pre-pigmented lime render which we pretty pretty much successfully matched the Dulux weather shield on the other side of the building um, and then the clients painted all the new oak work and in with a nasty black paint to match the rest of the building and then um, that's the job finished except that this is quite interesting because we got called back to this one um, a few weeks later to say that there were damp patches on the hempcrete and we were a bit like oh we've never had that before and uh, we came back to site and they said yes after the the big storm recently you can you, you can't see them now because they're drying out but there was a there was a damp patch here and there was a damp patch here and there was some over here and we were scratching scratching our heads trying to work out why that would have happened and then we realized that the damp patches were next to all of the timbers that we'd had to replace when we came to first came to take the wall apart and so what's happening is that water was always getting into the wall um, but previously it was being trapped by the ply and the cement and the and the um, bubble wrap uh, in those positions, exact same positions where it's tracking down through the frame and collecting in particular area. Um, and that means that that's, that's why the, the oak frame had eventually rotted out. So water's still getting in as it always was. And looking at the building, I think probably the fact that there's no um, uh, flashing at the cheeks of the dormer would be the first place that I would start looking for uh, water ingress, but essentially um, what's happening, what you can see happening is the hempcrete doing its job. So the water comes down, gets into the wall, but is then allowed to breathe out or evaporate out through the, the um, vapour open structure of the hempcrete wall. Um, 
so that's just a nice example really of why uh, hempcrete's good in uh, listed buildings, traditionally constructed buildings. Uh, and that concludes my talk for this afternoon. So hopefully uh, it was quite a a quick run through um, various uh, aspects. It's a really big subject with a lot to say. I didn't really have time to get onto any kind of detailing, how, you know, construction de detailing of hempcrete in a building. So hopefully a few of you have got questions, but thanks for listening and um, thanks for the uh, invite to come and speak. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and I'm also going to have a couple of questions. I've got one from... Um... James here who is unable to answer the question ask the questions for himself so James is asking Alex how easy and often would in situ hemp walls and ground slabs be to repair and what kind of damage is most common um, yeah good question so um, the only damage I've ever seen to hempcrete walls is where pre-rendering they've been left and they can be left um, open to the elements for, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but in a, um, in a for particular situations where there's been a year or so between casting the hempcrete wall and then rendering it. Um, I have, when people don't put um, rainwater goods on the building, <laughs> then you can get hempcrete either, uh, sorry, water either running down the hempcrete uh, in certain areas or splashing off the scaffolding and hitting the wall. Um, and in that case, I've seen um, little areas where the hempcrete has gone soft and the remediation of that was purely just raking out the soft stuff, making up a new mix and daubing it into the ho hole by hand to fill it back out. And we often get asked about the uh, longevity of hempcrete. And obviously we've only got buildings from dating from the late 80s um, but if you think what hempcrete uh, is I mean it was originally developed in France for the uh, purpose of replacing uh, degraded or or disappeared wattle and daub panels in medieval timber frames um, which had largely lasted perfectly well for several hundred years until someone had put a cement render on them in the 60s uh, and then between the 60s and the 90s uh, that was enough to trap water in and destroy the the uh, original wattle and daub so hempcrete is you can think of hempcrete like um a sort of more robust version of what of daub so the daub was basically um subsoil a bit of animal dung, a bit of lime if you could afford it, straw, some other biomaterial as a reinforcing. And that lasted happily, properly maintained for hundreds of years. So hempcrete is really just a more robust version of that. And like the wattle, uh, like the daub, sorry, hempcrete is a non-structural material. So if there was ever a failure or lack of maintenance that caused the hempcrete to, to need to be replaced, you can cut out a section of the wall and recast it because it's the structural frame that's doing the structural work. And I feel like there was another part to that conversation. Oh, floor slabs. Never had to repair one. Um, I have been to Belgium. My colleagues in Belgium will quite happily put hempcrete into a floor below ground level. Um, and they don't see a problem with that. I, as I said earlier, prefer to have it above grade just because it's a plant material. And I, and I think that surely is... is you're at risk of shortening the lifespan of the floor um, by putting it below, um, but it's normal there. Not, but we don't do it here. Thanks, Alex. Um, and another question from Inez. I can't, I can't seem to unmute her and she has asked me to ask it for her. So are there any disadvantages in using hempcrete for high density buildings such as offices and flats? And if so, what are these disadvantages and how, they, how can they be overcome? Um, I don't think there are any disadvantages. Um, the the size of building um, that you're, or rather the limit on the size of your hempcrete building is to do with the structural frame rather than the hempcrete itself. Um, so properly detailed, there shouldn't be any reason why hempcrete should cause problems in a larger scale office or, or apartment building. In fact, it's rather going to give you some... Um, uh, advantages of as we said summer cooling and uh, winter staying warm with 
um, minimal um, heating and cooling systems within the building. And also it has a really good acoustic performance. So um, it's been um, shown to be perfectly suitable for party walls um, construction within the UK building regulations. So in general, it's, yeah, there's nothing but advantages in that context. Thank you. That's that's really interesting, actually. And um, it seems to me that it's got so many positives. It's hard to, hard to see why it's not in the mainstream and being used as a as a construction material. But this is my question, actually. What do you identify as the main obstacle um, to this material being used more widely? Is it simply knowledge about the material's sort of strength? It's the natural plant base that's sort of it's quite off-putting do you think what, what's uh not really uh so i think that that is sometimes an issue and the the british construction industry is bless them is not the most uh good at sort of thinking outside the box and adapting new th um ideas but having said that that builders hempcrete is quite recognizable to the trade because it's something that you uh, build a stick frame and then you mix up and you cast it in formwork and they kind of understand the process if not the big bales of hemp so and once they see we work alongside other contractors all the time in a range of contexts and when they see how well it works they're immediately sort of like well it's so simple the method is so simple and the performance is so high why wouldn't you build everything like this the main barrier to scale up currently is the fact that um, it's for scale house building uh, people expect to put put up housing for development cost of like 800 pound a square meter um, so in you know the context of um, you know domestic uh, you know one-off houses bespoke houses although you know there's obviously a range within that market but we would be looking at between 2000 2500 in that market for sort of high quality bespoke um individual house so it's really about it's a design challenge um to to develop ways and we're kind of working on that with bigger companies at the moment looking at ways of detailing uh hempcrete in a building and obviously there are economies of scale to be had but sort of setting it up so that people can build with it and get the advantages but at a lower lower cost but we also as a country need to change the conversation because all anybody will talk about is build cost and we need to actually say look you know even if we make the build cost the same for hempcrete versus conventional materials hempcrete houses you don't need to heat so the the lifetime of the building the running costs of that building are much lower and we we, we as an industry need to be clear about what we're selling in terms of housing and how future-proofed it is and that needs to be taken into account in the the product that you're you're selling builders need to be confident of that I see yeah very um very difficult sort of one to resolve <laughs> um we've got a great question from Susanna who's very happy to ask it in person so Susanna would you like to to go ahead Oh uh, yes, hello. Uh, I was wondering, I was wondering if uh, it can be reused or recycled at the end of the building's life, or can we design for the construction with this material? Mm. Yeah, so it's a good question, and it's uh, in theory because we haven't taken many hempcrete buildings down, uh, but in theory it can either be crushed up and allowed to um, compost. Um, at which point obviously the the trapped carbon is re released back into the atmosphere um, and it does it doesn't comp fresh hempcrete or hempcrete that's just been uh, cast or been around for a few years certainly doesn't compost very easily in its um, uh, you know if you just crush it up and um, put it on the land and that's because of the lime but over time uh, that I think is a possibility. It can also be ground up and re um, added to a new hempcrete building as part of the binder or as part of the um, uh, aggregate in the mix. Um, I was really frustrated uh, last year when um, the BRE took down a hempcrete 
demonstration hemp creek house that's been stood at the bre for about 10 12 years something like that um and uh i had tried to get hold of sort of 10 15 cubic meters of material from that building and i had an in vessel composting facility that was going to take it and tr do some trials for me and at the last minute the contractor didn't couldn't facilitate that so i was a bit that was a shame really it's a missed opportunity thank you alex um and there's a question now from telma who unfortunately can't unmute, unmute herself she's in an office but um i'll ask it for her if that's okay telma so what type of lime do you use um, and have you considered to produce the lime as well? And besides using hempcrete for the walls and plaster, have you used it for joints in a stonemasonry wall? Quite a lot of questions there. Yeah, that's fine. Um, so the lime, to answer the first question, the lime um, for the hempcrete binder can be uh, all sorts of different limes. So if, you've, if people are familiar with limes, they range from uh, what we call air limes, lime putty, um, and uh, hydrated air lime, which is uh, um, uh, made from a very pure limestone deposit and sets quite slowly on carbonation with the atmosphere once you put it in a building. Um, those limes are seen as the most um, environmentally friendly to use because they set through carbonation. They reabsorb a lot of the carbon that was given off when the lime was initially burnt in the kiln. And then there's another group of limes called hydraulic limes, um, which are either naturally occurring hydraulic limes that are made from a, an impure seam of limestone, which um, is, uh, 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 has, includes other minerals, which when the lime is burnt, it, it's burnt to a, a dry powder. Um, so it's, it's burnt in a kiln and then slaked to a dry powder um, because when it gets mixed with water it will set um, and it sets quite hard and it sets through reaction with the water as opposed to purely bicarbonation. So those limes reabsorb less carbon from the atmosphere in the curing process but they do set quite hard um, which is useful for hempcrete because we're trying to hold up thousands of particles of hemp. So uh, what we in, with the formulated binders, um, it's you can either use um, uh, a majority of the air lime, which is the the lime that sets through carbonation, mixed with another material to, that will give it a more hydraulic set. So that's either a what they call a pozzolan, which is a material that reacts with the lime, or sometimes a proportion of Portland cement is put into that binder just to give it the initial set while the rest of the binder cures so long way of saying there's a lot of different ways of formulating a hempcrete binder um, but the the idea is to get as much air lime in as possible to make the bio binder as environmentally friendly as possible with um, but still have that hydraulic set um, so that's the challenge and the other bit was about Oh, had hempcrete ever been used for stone walls? Not for um, a bedding mortar, but it's used quite commonly as a as an insulating layer against a stone wall um, to to add um, a little bit of thermal performance to traditional traditionally built stone buildings. Um, it can also be, uh, and the. Uh, instead of being applied as hempcrete, which is a matrix of hemp with a lime binder running through it, you can have a, a lime hemp plaster. So that's like a lime plaster with hemp, uh, some hemp in it, which gives it the properties of being a little bit more insulating uh, than a normal lime plaster, but also means that it has more structural um strength and you can apply it in a thicker layer so that's sometimes used in in old stone buildings as well and there are various commercial products uh, products commercially available in the uk um for lime hemp plasters thank you um, i hope that answered your question telma um and we've got a question now from kirsten shearer on the orkney hello. islands hello kirsten. i think um 
Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I think I, there was a question. I think um, I wrote it down, but it wasn't picked. If, if you don't mind, it's a very good one. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, it's Kyron. It's it's not Kirsten. It's Kyron. <laughs> I'm a boyfriend of Kirsten's, but listen then. Um, I've got I've got a few questions because we're actually just in the very early stages of planning a Hempcrete house in Orkney. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, one oh, of the questions from the architect we got was whether the house needed to be covered in, because of the extreme weather. So when the, the hemp crate was setting, mm -hmm. what, what do we need to do to, you know, avoid getting too much rainwater and wind? Yeah, yeah. You can't have too much wind. So we just, we built a hemp crate house on Orkney, uh, not last year, but the year before. All right. Have you, have you seen that house? No, nope. I didn't know nope. there was one. Just, just outside Ham on mainland Orkney. What? <laughs> so okay. if um, if you make a note of probably the easiest, this sounds like it would be. Um, what what uh, in hand? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Okay. So <laughs> so um, take a note of um, my email, and we can pick this conversation up afterwards okay. if you like. Um, but the um, uh, yeah. So the essentially the the set the initial set for hempcrete happens overnight so yeah. you cast the material it sets you take the formwork down you carry on building um okay. there is then a drying period um and uh, that can be in a in sort of summer temperatures in this country sort of six six to eight weeks before you're ready to apply a um lime plaster and lime render um, okay. i put in the book that the best time to do your hempcrete was sort of early summer kind of you know april may june so that you yeah. had the benefit of the summer for drying uh, the hempcrete but i yeah. wish i'd put uh, that it was best to do it in october november because everybody's building project seems they all plan to do it in may and then their yeah. building project gets delayed by six yeah, months yeah. Yeah. and they end up casting in september october yeah. yeah so we we cast a hempcrete house on orkney at the end of November two years ago Oof. and mm. and uh, yeah. and it was bone dry by the middle of February because uh, a normal day on Orkney is a 50 mile an hour wind <laughs> yeah, exactly. so it, it's yeah. not just sun yeah. <laughs> that dries yeah. uh, the building it wind does it really well as well so right. the only the only thing as you're building up is yeah. just to keep the top of the wall covered because you don't want more water entering into oh, the yeah. yeah. wall because yeah. that's just going to extend your drying time. Yeah. Um, the uh, it's fine to have rain against the walls uh, if you're in a location where it was literally non-stop driving rain for weeks. Then I might put a put a cover up and allow you know the surface of the wall to stay dry because otherwise yeah. Yeah. water's just not going to evaporate. But yeah. the hempcrete itself won't come to any harm. Okay, and also, well, now that you've just said that you've done a house in Orkney, what training is available for the local contractors, or did you use a local contractor? Yeah, uh, we didn't in that case. Uh, in that, that building, the local contractor did the groundworks and the plinth wall, right. and then we did the timber framing, the hempcrete, the lime finishes, and the lime floor. Right. Um, yeah. But... Uh, you know, I'd be more than happy because that's part of what we do is training local contractors. Yeah. Uh, I think um, the local contractor was fairly, you know, uh, impressed with the hempcrete and yeah, likes the performance. So we, be, you know, it's it's much makes much more sense for us to come up and do training and get yeah. a firm up there who are ready to. Uh, Ready to do it, yeah. Then, then us driving, uh, driving up and down the country doing it. The uh, the other thing to say is, I don't know if you got to the building warrant stage yet, but now, now there is one Hempcrete house on Orkney. You're already hopefully further further ahead with building warrant. Definitely. Yeah, we never knew that. So that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. But yeah, let's pick that up again. Uh, you know, yeah. After, yeah, after the, email, the call. Yeah, the email's just the UK Hempcrete one. Yeah. Yeah, just there. Yeah. Okay. Excellent, Alex. Cheers. All right. Okay. Cheers. And a question, I think this will be the last one. We're running out of time slightly, sorry everyone. From Andrew Niki, um, would you like to go ahead and we'll ask your question? Yeah, sure. Um, just, uh, um, I was gonna ask whether uh, hempcrete is uh, suitable for um, various climates, uh, and if you would perform um, 
in like a dry climate like Greece or Spain or mm. have an experience of building projects in South New Southern Europe. Yeah, sure. There's there's a lot of um I'm not sure about Greece particularly, but there's a lot of um hempcrete done in Italy and Spain and northern Africa. Um and as I was saying earlier, um as as you move into different climactic zones, um what sometimes happens is the formulation of the hempcrete changes. So mm -hmm. for example, in southern Spain, northern Africa, it's much more usual to use um a clay uh, binder perhaps with lime stabilized uh, earth so you've got maybe 15 percent lime and and an earth binder which that resulting material can um, can even be um, uh, load bearing in fact in some formulations um, mm -hmm. but it's not um, suitable for uh, use in the UK because you'd have to add another insulation material to it to get the level of um, insulation performance that we need up here but in um southern europe um the thermal mass is just as if not slightly more important than the uh, insulation especially during the summer months yep okay, thank you there's an uh, just to say there's an, uh, a company called um canabric spelt c-a-n-n-a-b-r-i-c uh in Spain I'm not quite sure of the region and the lady's name is Monica Brummer she's a German architect who's been living in Spain for a long time and she also does a lot of work in um, uh, Morocco and uh, Northern Africa so she's she's a really good contact for Southern European hemp Great. Great. Fantastic Thank you so much, Alex. Um, that was such an interesting talk and thanks to everyone who's stuck with us this far, thus far. Um, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, but um, this is the second talk in the Intbao Summer Series. So make sure that you're subscribed as a member to Intbao, um, which you can do on our website. Um, and you can also follow us at intbao.org. Um, and we have a Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter as well. Um, and we are at Intbao on all of those platforms. Um, so I'd just like to say thanks again and I hope to see you all on some more of the, the, the series in the next couple of months or so. Um, so thanks for joining and also this talk has been recorded and it will be available on Facebook and on our website later today. So um, for those of you who have colleagues who couldn't join, I'll make sure it's uploaded. Um, so thanks everyone and have a good rest of the day. Bye Alex. Goodbye. Thanks again. No worries. Thanks.